we need to define that term because everybody uses it, but it's not really well defined. So in my opinion, microservices are, well, small, but the core property of microservices are that they are independent deployment units. So if you look at software development, it's usually about around building modules. In Java, there are packages, there are jar files. So you would build your application from those modules. The problem, however, is that once you install the application, all those modules are more or less gone. So you just deploy all of the application. And that's different with microservices. So with microservices, every part of the application is actually independently deployable. So you would have maybe one WAR file or Java application that takes care of user registration in an e-commerce platform. And you would have another application that takes care of the catalog or whatever. That is how microservices are different. Instead of modularizing your application using packages or jar files, you do it using microservices. That has some neat advantages. So for example, you can use any technology in any microservice. So you can have one microservice in Java and uh, another microservice that is written in a different programming language or maybe uses a different application server or web server or whatever. That's an option, so you don't need to use any technology there is. However, in particular in the Java world, this is an advantage because if your application is just a large jar or WAR file, you need to define all the libraries on all the versions of the libraries. And that's somewhat bad because if you want to have a bug fix in a library, you need to make sure that every module in the whole application actually can deal with that new version of the library. If you use microservices, you can have one part of the application that uses a different version of a library than the rest of the application. So it's much easier to include some bug fixes in your application. So if you look at an application consisting of microservices, there is a server that runs a microservice and another server that runs another microservice. And that's basically how it works. In order for microservices to collaborate, you can use links. So in my opinion, microservices might include a web UI. And because they can include a web UI, they can just link to one another. So if there is a catalog, it can link to a details page of a product that is actually provided by a different microservice. Then there is data bar replication. So if you want to have some statistics about all the orders in your e-commerce application, maybe you want to have a different microservice that takes care of that. And uh, because there is a lot of data that needs to be handled there and a lot of statistics, you probably want to have, well, a copy of the database, probably using a different schema to provide those statistics. And that's what we are doing here. So it's actually not a big surprise. It's just what we are doing, doing with data warehouses for quite a long time. And then they can talk REST to one another and they can use messaging to talk to one another. This slide is actually quite important to me because a lot of people think that microservices are just small REST-based services, and I disagree. I think they can also be integrated using other means, as we've seen here. So they can just link to one another, or they can use data replication, for example. So let's take a look at the infrastructure that we need for microservices. Obviously, the challenge is that there are just a lot of services. So we need an infrastructure that makes it easy to create new projects because, well, first of all, we have a lot of projects and actually the number of projects usually grows. So that means if you develop your software for a long time, there are just two options. Either um, the individual microservices grow in size at, at one point, they cannot really be called microservices anymore, or do you just create more of them, more microservices? And I think... Uh, you need to create more of them because otherwise they will just grow and become hard to handle. And if it's easy to create a new project, uh, well, people will probably create new projects instead of putting the code in the old projects. So I think that's quite important. Make it easy to create new projects to make sure that microservices actually stay small. REST should be integrated because that's an option for communication. Messaging should be supported. We should have uniform operations because with that large number of microservices, it's hard to keep track of those microservices and uh, to make sure that all of them are actually, well, behaving correctly. 
And if we have uniform operations, it's less effort because then we just have one way of dealing with those microservices and we just have to be, have more of them, but we don't need to have special requirements for each of them. So we need to have one way for those microservices to uh, report statistics, for example, or metrics. To answer those challenges, I think Spring Boot is a good tool. So let's take a look at a very simple Spring Boot application. So here it is. To actually make it a Spring application or a Spring Boot application, we need to annotate it using add enable auto configuration. That sets up a Spring Boot configuration, including a web environment. So that would include an embedded web server like a Tomcat, for example, and all the other things that Spring needs to set up such an environment. Then we would need to start this class once the application starts. So that's what we do with this line of code. Then that would start Tomcat, the web environment, and all these kinds of things. If we really want to have some application, we actually need to have it answer to, let's say, REST codes, for example. So we annotate this class as a REST controller. That's a very simple Spring annotation. So it's not specific to Spring Boot. It's just a Spring annotation. And here is a method that would return hello if an HTTP request comes in. Okay, so what do we need to actually make that thing run? Well, we need to have a Maven POM. So that Maven POM would just have one single parent POM, which is the one that is provided by Spring Boot. And the nice thing about this is, this is the only version you will ever see in your POM, except for, well, very specific dependencies. So this actually cho chooses a Spring stack that is compatible with one another, and uh, you don't need to specify any versions of the Spring framework or anything else. So we have a single dependency, which includes everything that we need for a web application. It's called a Spring Boot Starter. There are quite a few other starters too. So for example, you can have a starter for a messaging application and so on and so on. And finally, we need to have a plugin that creates the jar file that is executable. So you can just start it using java-jar you can also have a WAR file, and actually you can have a hybrid. So you can have a WAR file that you can deploy on your application server, and that also runs as an executable jar. So it's obviously possible to run Spring Boot applications on an application server if you want to. So concerning simple infrastructure, we've seen that there is just a POM XML. You can also use Gradle or ARNT if you want to. There are very few dependencies, um, and you don't need to have, specify any of the versions. There is just one plugin, and the versions for all the libraries are actually defined. As we've also seen, REST is integrated. So there is support in Spring MVC, as we've seen in the code. There is also support in Spring Boot for JuxRS using Jersey. So if you would rather want to use JuxRS, that's fine. You can just use uh, Jersey with Spring Boot, and there is a starter for you. You can also use messaging for microservices to talk to one another. Actually, there are quite a few Spring Boot starters for that too. So there is a starter for AMQP using RapidMQ. AMQP is an on-the-wire protocol that is standardized. There is a starter for HornetQ, which is a JMS implementation. There is a starter for ActiveMQ. Well, actually, it's not there yet, but it is in, in the snapshot versions. And uh, you can just use those to run to use JMS. Um, if you want to use a different JMS implementation, let's say Oracle Active Advanced Queuing, for example, then uh, you would need to include the libraries for advanced queuing yourself, but you can still do it. So there is just no starter, and it's somewhat harder to do, but it's still possible to use other JMS implementations using Spring Boot 2. For the messaging support, there is also the Spring JMS abstraction that uses message-driven pochos, plain old Java objects. So it just can forward a JMS call to some Java object. And it's actually very scalable, so you can have multi-threading on all these kinds of things. So it's very, very simple to send JMS messages out to. So you can do that using the JMS template. 
and that simplifies the JMS API quite considerable. So for example, there are runtime exceptions which make error hinting much easier. Of course, you can use other libs too. So as I said, other JMS implementations are definitely an option. And at the end of the day, Spring Boot can just do everything that Java and Spring can do. Uh, so it's not really limited. Okay, so what do we have now? It's obviously very easy to create a new project. There is just a POM that needs to be defined. You need to define some Java classes and you're done. REST is integrated. That's great. Messaging is supported too. So we need to talk about deployment now. So deployment. Actually, what you do is you just package everything in one executable jar file or in a WAR file uh, using Maven, Ant, or Gradle. You can add some configuration to it. There are quite a few options. So, for example, you can have an application.properties that gives some configuration in your jar file. You can have it in your on your server and so on and so on. So what I want to show you now is a demo how such a Spring Boot application can be built, how you can create a zip for the Oracle Application Container Cloud. That is an infrastructure that allows you to run Java applications on a platform as a service. So there are no servers. It's just a platform that allows you to run Java SE-based applications. So it's a good fit for Spring Boot. If you want to do it yourself, the demo itself, the code for the demo, is actually on my GitHub account. So feel free to look at it. So I'm going to show you how to build the demo. So we are using Maven and creating a fresh package here. As you can see, it just compiles the sources and the test is run. Actually, this test goes through the REST interface, so it does actual HTTP calls. To run it on the Oracle Container Cloud, we need to have a manifest that's a JSON file. We can look at it. And as you can see, it just contains which Java version should be used and how the application should be started and a little bit more information. So we put the jar that has just been created by Maven and the manifest in a zip file. And this is what we are going to use in the Oracle Cloud. So we go to the application container cloud and we create a new application, select Java SE as the platform. We give it a sensible name. Uh, we choose the subscription and the application archive that we just created. We create that application. And after a while, the application is being uploaded. And then finally, it actually has been created. So let's take a look. Here is the application. There are no instances running at the moment. So it's still being created. And after a while, uh, there are instances there. So one instance with one gig of memory. And now we can actually go to the URL and we see that hello is printed out, which is what that application does. It's a very simple hello world. So what if you want to install the application on a server or on the Oracle Compute Cloud instead of the Oracle Application Container Cloud? Well, you need to install a basic machine. You need to install Java on that machine. You need to copy over the jar file. And uh, you can also make it a Linux service. So since Spring Boot 1.3, it's actually possible to make a Spring Boot application a Linux service, and that's rather easy. All you need to do is you need to create a link in the right directory. And you can create some kind of application or properties to configure the application. That's the standard configuration file that you can use. So also that is very, very easy. Uh, so even if you don't use a, a pass cloud, it's still very easy to deploy the application. So if we've seen the deployment is actually very simple. What about operations? As I said, we need to have uniform operations. So we need to have one way to create metrics from all the services to make life easier for operations. So there is Spring Boot Actuator. Actuator is another Spring Boot starter that provides information about the application via HTTP and JSON or metrics. Metrics is a library that 
for example, would provide that information for graphite monitoring tool. And there are a lot of other options too. So there are integrations for many, many other mon monitoring systems. So that information can be evaluated by some monitoring tool. And um, it's a different approach from to monitoring. So while before you would rely on the application server to provide some monitoring for all your applications. Now you just use the standard tool that you're using anyway for, for monitoring probably, and you just feed in more information. So also uniform operations is handled by Spring Boot. 